introduction. Thank you very much for that introduction, Graham. And uh, we'll get started. So, th what I want to talk about today is is perhaps integrating uh, various tools together um, to uh, Im improve our analysis methods in functional MRI. Uh, Oh. Um, yeah, so uh, putting together uh, data-driven tools and, and uh, sort of model-based model uh, analysis um, to do uh, help interpretation of uh, data-driven models, uh, data, sorry, interpretation of data-driven um, analyses, uh, using this for automated noise filtering and also uh, a, a novel method to use data-driven methods to actually help in uh, interpretation of flexible uh, and general linear model results. So the modeling that I'm talking about, the modeling that I'm talking about uh, is, is uh, just for the computational neurosciences in the audience, it's not uh, computational neuroscience modeling, it's statistical modeling of the sort that JB was talking about. So in, in the very simplest form, um, you know, you know, you've got a signal in it and you try to model it with a, a general linear uh, model here. You, you've got a priori effect of interest or uh, which might be what the subject is doing, for example, uh, and uh, other effects that might be confounds such as motion or other artifact that you know about. And you try to fit this model uh, to the measured uh, signal and, uh, and then you can compare the size of these uh, coefficients that you fit with the residual or unexplained noise. So that's statistical modeling. Um, so we're, we're using the information in a prior sense. <coughs> Contrast that with data-driven approaches, um, so blind source separation approaches such as principal components analysis and uh, independent components analysis, uh, which are really um, taking the data in its raw form and trying to work out what underlying sources might be contributing to the variance in the data. So this is a so-called cocktail party problem. You've got a um, room full of people and they're all talking and you measure sound in various microphones and try to deconvolve the individual uh, voices. So this blind source separation, um, you don't have to put any information in to start except for the data, but then you have to, to make any sense of it at the end of the day, uh, you need to interpret it and that's done in a post hoc way. So can we apply some a priori information to that post hoc interpretation of data driven uh, methods? And of course uh, one can, but can, can we do it in, a, in an automated and objective way rather than just subjective interpretation of components? Well, we know some th things are gonna pop out of an ICA just from experience, uh, uh, anyone who's done this. Um, you know, if you've got head motion in the functional MRI, you'll tend to get edge artifact in the, in the resultant images. Pulsatile motion will, will um, evidence itself with ventricular activity. Um, the non-blood oxygen level dependent uh, signal in a fu functional MRI is often very broadband, higher frequencies than you expect from the hemodynamic response function. So if there's a lot of high frequency, uh, temporal frequency um, information present then it's in the component, then it's not likely to be a bold uh, signal. And uh, also in independent components analysis, um, uh, Estimating the model order is a problem and, and you often overestimate that and then you get uh, lots of components that are spotty or speckled, uh, which are non-physiological. So if we know this much already, um, can we apply this in a sort of automatic classification scheme? Well, uh, the answer is we can and there have been some r recent efforts in this uh, over the last few years in this, uh, starting with sort of a, a, a systematic visual inspection, sort of more a protocol driven visual inspection, but of course that's very laborious. Uh, and then we developed this uh, algorithm SOC, which is a fully automated algorithm that takes those features that I spoke about just a moment ago and tries to identify components that fit within those categories and uh, identify them as noise. Um, and, and one can use that, uh, and I'll talk about a little bit in, in detail about that in a moment. Uh, and there have been some other recent approaches that have, uh, uh, have also come out uh, in the last few years, some with software uh, that, that is not available, so we can't test those, but most of them uh, are available for, uh, for um, uh, others to, to use. This one's quite an interesting one that uh, queries an external feature database um, that they build up and you can uh, help use it to identify uh, a particular uh, resting state networks, for example. And there's methods that you can use and, and that require training on your own data. 
So uh, just to talk a little bit about SOC, um, it's named somewhat whimsically after uh, this, uh, an acronym of, of this uh, term here, Spatially Organised Component Classificator, that being the German word for classifier. Um, and it, it, uh, in its main use, just uh, identifies artifactual components and components that are, are not likely to be artifact. And importantly, it can be applied to resting state as well as task-based fMRI. It's fully automated. You don't have to train it. Um, the software is freely uh, uh, available. And uh, in distinction to most of the other packages out there, one of the key philosophies in, in this particular uh, algorithm, uh, we've tuned it to not remove any components likely to be of neuronal origin. So um, the, the particular issue here, particularly in a clinical environment, is if you've got an independent components analysis that hasn't quite split uh, a noise uh, source from a, 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 a bold physiological source and you might get some mixing, uh, in a clinical sense, perhaps when you're doing pre-surgical mapping or something, you, you don't want to be re removing anything that might be bi biologically plausible. So we've been conservative in that uh, uh, sense, although we can tune it um, to, to more the neuroscience questions if we want to, uh, and more aggressively uh, remove things that might have any um, artifact in them. So uh, I'll just uh, mention uh, one of the uh, features of the algorithm. but. Um, uh, and one of the reasons that you can use this really straight out of the box is that uh, it uses adaptive clustering of the features that we've put in there. So we, we, we basically start with a hypothesis that your fMRI data will contain certain noise classes like I mentioned. I mean, it's, in, it's virtually impossible to get anybody in the scanner unless they're dead um, uh, not to move, right? So there will be some degree of motion artifact in an fMRI data set. So, um, in this case, uh, uh, this slide's uh, illustrating the uh, uh, idea of spatial frequencies. Um, so the, the overfitting problem where we might have spotty components or, uh, uh, compared to um, more biologically plausible components. So here we have a metric that uh, looks at the ratio of spatial frequencies, uh, low spatial frequencies and high spatial frequencies. It takes a ratio and plots that uh, uh, as a function of the radius of, of, of how big this uh, circle is. So this is, this is just a... a, a um, essentially a Fourier uh, transform of the data, uh, and the low frequency frequencies in the middle high out here. Um, if you plot then how that the ratio tracks, and you get these curves, and then you can cluster that with a k-means clustering on, or another algorithm, but we, we use k-means, it was sufficient, and cluster those into groups, and then you can allocate a score based on how, um, how much high frequency speckle there is in the data compared to the low frequency. And we can do similar things for the uh, uh, temporal domain in, in, in terms of the, the um, uh, temporal frequencies uh, and also edge artifact in an edge mask and uh, cerebral sp spinal fluid mask. So this works quite well and is robust and, and removes typically in, a, in an ICA analysis of fMRI about half the components so you don't have to look at and interpret. So that's great for interpreting the data-driven uh, analysis, but you can also then take this one step further. Having identified the noise, you can uh, actually combine this now with a model-based approach and use this as a pre-filtering step. So we've done this, and uh, uh, tested this, for example, for language functional MRI, and uh, we did this uh, on a, a study of 29 uh, subjects, and here is a plot of the mean Z scores within uh, a presumed language region of interest uh, with, uh, without uh, SOC on, uh, on the x-axis here and with SOC on the y-axis, showing that most of the uh, uh, subjects showed improved uh, z-score when SOC was used as a pre-filter. Now, importantly, we're taking into account the fact that uh, we're reducing the degrees of freedom, so we adjust our analysis to take that into account, and we still get these improved z-scores. Um, there were only three subjects that showed anything below the line, and only one that was sort of really uh, significantly below the line, and I'll show you that example in a minute. That's um, uh, here are some examples, anyways, uh, four of the, of the subjects showing you the, the kind of improvement that you can get. So these are three slices through a particular subject uh, uh, language study uh, with, without the SOC processing and then with the SOC processing and the, arrow, the red arrows here have highlighted activity that's, uh, that's likely artifact that's been uh, removed by this filtering and green arrows show significant activity that's now appeared that we weren't sensitive uh, to because of the noise in the... In the um, uh, uh, pre-SOC analyses. Um, so, uh, we, you know, we get rid of ventricular artifact and edge artifact, we enhance the, uh, the activity in general. Uh, this subject 22 here was that subject that was uh, most below the line in, in our um, uh, comparison metric, and if we just have a closer look at that one, 
we think actually what's going on here is a, is a problem with our metric more than a problem with the SOC algorithm. Um, so the, the activity that's been removed is this activity here and here, which uh, as you can see is, is actually on a contrast boundary within the image. Um, and it's, um, it's actually uh, a little bit uh, lower than one we expect uh, typical language activity to be. This is the language activity we're expecting. Um, and so, in, but, but it just, it just uh, got at the bottom of our regions of interest. So we actually counted this as a loss of uh, real activity, whereas in fact, if you uh, look at it uh, uh, with a keen eye, we think w that SOX actually removed some motion artifact. Turned out this was the subject that had the most motion in this study. Um, there, was, there was a great deal of motion going on. And so uh, it's difficult actually to, to remove this kind of motion artifact in, 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 in any other way than an independent component. And, and this uh, motion was identified because it was such high frequency compared to uh, temporal frequency compared to the, uh, what we'd expect with bold. So ICA managed to separate it and then removing it um, got rid of, cleaned it up. So um, just to make the point, we're, we're not reinventing the, the wheel here. Um, to do uh, much of this processing, we used existing software. So we used um, the FSL Melodic uh, program to do the ICA, SPM to help with the segmentation and some other code from fMRI stat, uh, and then our own custom MATLAB code to implement the rest of the algorithm and wrap the whole thing together. And this is, this is as I say, is public available. So now I just want to uh, talk about uh, the, the idea of using a data-driven approach to help interpret a general linear model type approach. And now why would you perhaps want to do that? Well, if the particular application we were interested in is if you've got an event-related fMRI study, so you know when events are happening, or you've given a presentation, uh, stimuli or what have you, and, um, and you want to uh, analyze that in a general linear model, but, this, but you don't actually know what the response is, uh, and this can happen, for example, um, if, if, if you don't have a delta, if you've got a, a light flash, you expect a, 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 the response to be a delta function convolved with an HRF. But if you've got some cognitive task or a cont continual light flashing, for example, where you might get a training effect, so the, the, um, uh, the, the response is not actually a, a, either a delta function or a, or a block, or you might have an anticipatory response that you're interested in that might happen actually before you present the stimuli and you might be interested in that. You can't model that with a conventional uh, uh, HRF. Uh, and in the particular application that we developed this method for was perhaps the most difficult where we're looking at uh, interictal epileptic spikes in patients uh, with, with epilepsy. Um, we detect these with simultaneous electroencephalography, so electrodes on the scalp. These spikes happen subclinically between seizures and, and are often quite frequent in these patients. Um, but the thing about them is we only see them on the EEG when a lot of the cortex, 10 square centimetres or so, is synchronously firing. And there's um, quite often activity happening in the brain before that that the functional MRI is sensitive to. So we don't know the shape of that to put into uh, a, a, a constrained general linear model. And this is an example of Rolandic epilepsy just showing some of our earlier work uh, that the response, the average response over a group of these patients is really quite different uh, shown here to the canonical uh, hemodynamic response function. So you're not going to be able to get fit these well even if you put you know, dispersion derivatives or whatever uh, in the model. So in these sorts of situations you need to use some sort of a deconvolution, uh, 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 basically invert the, the normal equation. So here we've got some event timings that we know. Uh, uh, we would uh, uh, typically convolve these with an HRF and look for that in the measured bold signal. Um, Instead, what we do here is we take the measured bold signal in these times and, 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 and invert this equation and try and work out what this effective hemodynamic response function is. Now, I've put it in inverted commas because it's really our, our hemodynamic response convolved with some neuronal response train that's not just a delta function. Uh, and then we get a map, and we can look at this with an F test. So um, in, in this deconvolution, typically it's affected by using a finite impulse response or a, or a Fourier basis set or some flexible basis set in our GLM. So now we've got a situation where we've identified where things might be happening uh, consistently that are, are time-locked to these events, but there's a different response function at every single voxel in the brain. So how do you actually interpret that? How can you summarize that in a way that's going to help you uh, 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 interpret? So this is where we uh, add in the uh, ICA step, and we call this event-related ICA or EICA. 
Now, instead of doing the ICA on the whole time course of the functional MRI, what we're doing is we do this uh, deconvolution with a GLM, and then we assume that there are specific underlying sources to this, and we use the ICA to decompose just those event-related time courses. So now we're looking at a very restricted model of what we think is consistently going on in each voxel. Um, and so uh, we get much fewer components typically than you would if you were doing the whole fMRI time series because you're now only getting things that are time locked to those events. So in that example of uh, Rolandic epilepsy, um, if you do a conventional general linear model with a, a conventional hemodynamic response function, these events you get very little activity. If you apply the ICA method, um, you now get beautiful activity where you expect it in the Rolandic region with a time course that's uh, significantly different from uh, the hemodynamic response. You can concatenate these uh, time courses together across you know, um, individuals to do group ICA in, in much the same way as you would do group ICA if, in, in a conventional sense. And, and again, you get, you, uh, get robust activity and this non-canonical uh, response shape. So uh, we've developed a, a package that we're about to release that does this analysis in an automated way. We're using fast ICA and a CASO uh, software, so existing software again, SPM for the general linear model, and then custom MATLAB code that, that implements the rest of it around that. Now, um, we've actually gone one step further and combined the, the two things that I've talked about. We can actually pre-filter our uh, EEG fMRI data or our event-related data with the SOC filter so that's going to filter the whole fMRI time course, identify noise sources based on that entire time source course, remove that before we do event-related ICA. So we deconvolve then the filtered time course in, uh, with the general linear model and then apply ICA again on the uh, 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 event-related time courses. And if we do that in Rolandic epilepsy, this is the group uh, component that I showed you earlier. We got one component that showed Rolandic activity, but um, with the increased power of, uh, uh, due to the noise reduction from the pre-processing with SOC, we now actually have the power to, to separate these two uh, uh, com uh, uh, components of activity here. So we got a hint that there was some uh, contralateral activity. So this is the spikes are coming from this area in these patients, but there's a bit of a hint of a contralateral activity. Well, with this denoised analysis, we now see that, yes, these, these spikes are, 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 are giving us this uh, uh, response here, but then somewhat later there's a response that's coming on the other side of the brain and we now have the power to separate that. So uh, in conclusion, um, we can combine uh, data-driven analysis methods and modeling analysis methods to help sort of get the best of both worlds. Um, and we can even top and tail these uh, uh, re um, analysis methods. Um, and using uh, existing uh, software to, uh, to enable this makes, uh, makes this much uh, easier to develop and fast track these sorts of developments. So uh, I'd like to just uh, end uh, thanking uh, the, the other contributors to this work and uh, I've noted their uh, disciplines here. You can see this is quite a multidisciplinary uh, uh, team that's, uh, that's been involved. So thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, David. So we've got, got time for one question. The uh, okay. deconvolution aspect is, must be uh, very difficult. Uh, like, uh, the, if you uh, just think of the, uh, the magnitude, I mean, the, uh, the, the model is not identifiable. If you, uh, so what, what are the constraints that you put on the deconvolution? Uh, well, the deconvolution is just using the, the conventional, uh, as you would do if you were trying to model what the hemodynamic response function was. But you would use a flexible basis set. So you could either use a finite impulse response set or a, 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 a number of <coughs> Fourier components. So instead of having one effect of interest, you're now saying it, it, your effects are actually different um, but uh, you're not trying to basis sets. You're not trying to find the neuronal trends and the hemodynamic response at the same time? So because what, because what if you try to find that, those two things, I mean, that's not identifiable. You have to put some constraint. You have to put some regularization constraint to uh, make it. Uh, well, well, the constraint is that it's time locked with that event, right? So we've got oh, multiple okay. events. Okay, that's uh, that's easy. Right. Then. So that that that's yeah. the one thing we I do see, model. I see. I understand right. now. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks, David. Okay, we need to to move on.